we're, we're sort of just marveling at the idea that it's been 10 years since, you know, Walter White first ran around the desert in his underwear. And now here we are. 10 I years later. can't believe it. It's, you, you and I were talking beforehand, Chris. I cannot believe it's been 10 years. Uh, just uh, my how time flies. It is. Of course, we're wearing the ceremonial 10 year anniversary outfit gray jacket, black yes. shirt. Uh, tweed is for 10th, you know, when you're married, 10th anniversary is tweed. Totally. <laughs> we, we decided to dress in stark contrast to the colorful set uh, of everything else. But, um, you know, Breaking Bad is one of those shows that. It is one of those shows that when you meet someone and you go, oh, my favorite shows are this, you know, Breaking Bad, and then if by some rare chance someone goes, oh, I haven't watched that yet, you get very like, what the F is wrong with you? You know, you get very aggressive because it legitimately, and I'm not saying this because you're right here, but I would say this if you weren't here, it is literally one of the best shows in the history of television oh, with, with Breaking Bad. God bless you. God so bless gonna, you, Chris. We're going to talk a little bit about that and sort of sort of go through its inception and the and the process and the the, the flow for you and then and then we'll get reflective afterwards. So, um, 2007, the show premieres. What was the process getting up to that point? When did you pitch the show? How did you conceive the show? And what was your original concept? I was talking to a buddy of mine named Tom Schnauz, who uh, is uh, now an executive producer of Better Call Saul. He was a producer on, on Breaking Bad, and uh, w one of my very oldest friends met him back in 1986 uh, at NYU Film School, and he and I were uh, had been working on The X-Files, which ended its run in uh, 2002. I've Our, heard of it. Yeah, I've heard of The X-Files. <laughs> and uh, um, around 2004, it had been off the air for two years. And uh, we were really bummed, Tom and I were bummed, that we, we, this, we, this great job was over. We loved this job. And we had been two years kind of in the desert where we didn't really have any, any employment. And I was talking to him on the phone one day around 2004 and said, hey, you know, what's, what's up with you? You got any jobs on the horizon? No. How about you? No. And we talked about, well, maybe we should go be greeters at Walmart because that's about <laughs> all, all we were good for. Uh, and he made a joke about putting a meth lab in the back of an RV and driving around uh, seeing the sights and making some money. You're sure he was kidding. <laughs> it was no. one of those things you're like, you're joking. Oh, yeah, we're just throwing out ideas. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. You know, you might not. You know, times were tough. You might not have been. But I, I could tell you for sure, I, I, I took his idea and stole it and ran away with it. Uh, Good for you. So he, but actually, when we were talking on the phone, I... You know, it, that was not what I did when I, was, when I heard this idea. Just something snapped in me, and I, and I thought, i got to steal that. But, but, <laughs> but you know, what r really excited me about it was not the meth. Uh, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it was the idea of if he and I were actually, if we had to make money doing the worst possible thing we could conceive of, these two, two of the most boring middle-aged plain vanilla guys you've ever met. I mean, because Tom and I both in real life just couldn't be much more uh, law-abiding or boring. <laughs> what would it take for me? What would it take for Tom in real life if we had to make money fast? What would it take to make us do the worst possible thing we could monetize? And, uh, you know, cooking meth was about it. And uh, so it... it um, you know, in that moment, I thought, God, that would be a really interesting character. So it, was, it wasn't a mess so much. It was the character that uh, at that point uh, you know, on this phone call didn't have a name for him yet. But there was that kind of Archimedean, you know, eureka moment. I'm trying to snap here. And uh, there you go. That's pretty sad. Sad snap. <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was really the moment where, where, where the idea hit. And I think in hindsight, you know, because everything's clearer in hindsight, I was about to turn 40 years old. I was about to have, uh, I figured, oh man, time for a big midlife crisis. And I thought, what if it wasn't a midlife crisis? What if it, if it was an end of life crisis? So I think that's, in hindsight, that's why it really grabbed me when it did. And so did you, you, you pitch this idea, because obviously Sony uh, made the show and then it went to AMC. Did you pitch this idea around? Were, were people like, why, what, what is this? idea this this a chemistry teacher who's going to be a meth dealer i don't understand do people understand it right away or did you really have to have to hard sell it or what was the pitching process the pitching process was like most pitching processes in hollywood they they mostly fail you know if they <laughs> and and you know seriously i mean it's it's 
it's not even necessarily a terrible thing, but it's, you know, in, in baseball, if you, if you bat 300, if you, what is that? In other words, if you, you know, every 10 times at bat, you hit the ball You're three talking times. sports. If you want to talk Quidditch, I, I can do that. That's the only, the only thing I know about I don't know anything about, about actual sports. Yeah, that's about I all know I know about, about wizard sports. sports but, that's but, it. You're, but you're like, uh, you make 20, 30 million bucks a year if you hit the ball three times out of 10. It's, right. it's like Hollywood. Hollywood pitches are the same way, uh, like baseball. If you, you know, most of the time you pitch, you fail. But in this case, I was very lucky. The very first two guys I pitched it to, were Zach Van Amberg and uh, Zach Van Amberg and Jamie Ehrlich, who were uh, who were uh, running development, uh, running uh, uh, running things at uh, Sony Television, and those guys I knew and I had uh, worked with before, and they I pitched to them. I go over to Culver City and I'm pitching to these guys, and I'm thinking, God, this is a really exciting idea. And these guys said, open door policy. Anytime I had something, come on in. So I'm sitting there talking to them. Five minutes in, you know, I get the guy, middle-aged guy, cancer, get the meth going, you know, get the saddest hand job in the world and all this stuff. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm There's pitching. our hashtag. <laughs> 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 write, write what you know. So, <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so, but... Uh, oh, that's the best. So, I'm pitching <laughs> to these two guys and I'm thinking, ah, this is, everyone's going to love this. And I see this look of dawning horror in their eyes. I'm not even kidding. Their eyes get wider and wider, but not with excitement, more with disbelief. Like, what the, what am I listening to here? Yeah. And, and so it's a little part of me is floating above and behind me off, off to the right as I'm watching myself pitch. And I'm thinking, this is a bad idea. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but, so, but to their credit, they got to the end of the pitch and I thought, well, this is going to be a quick, you know, thank you for coming in, usher you out the door kind of thing. They were into it. And I found out later, they went to their, to their, 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 their boss, the big boss at uh, Sony, and he, and they fought for it. And he hated it. And to his credit, though, and I give this gentleman credit, he admits it to this day. He says, I, I thought it was a bad idea when I heard it. And by the way, he wasn't alone. A lot of people thought it was a bad idea. But he said to, to Zach and Jamie, he said, you know, if, I hired you for your taste. If you think this is something you really want to get behind, so be it. And, and I respect that. And then, uh, so then uh, I was, it was at that point officially a Sony project in terms of Sony was a studio. In other words, we had a studio signed on. And then came the process that I was talking about a minute ago with the baseball and the, you know, the pitching where you pitch around. And most people say no, which is the case always, no matter what the idea is. All it takes is one, though. One person says yes, and ultimately... Uh, AMC said yes. Thank, thank goodness. After all, after a whole lot of no's. So yeah, but it, it is amazing when you when you get into that side of the business. Uh, you kind of go. It's not only astonishing that anything gets made, but that anything gets made and might be good, yeah. just because of how tumultuous the process is. And especially being at the YouTube space with a lot of creators, I think it's very comforting for people to hear that you know th that this guy who created this amazing show at the beginning sort of felt like oh my god was this not a good idea i don't know some people don't like this idea but you were still able to to see it through and so once you start developing the show it, do you start getting a clearer idea because what's so simple to me about the concept is you've always described it as mr chips becomes scarface yeah. basically and that's your arc so you know what your whole series arc is right there yeah you it's the it's the it's the cardinal direction, so to speak. You don't know all the twists and turns that are going to get you from, say, Virginia to Los Angeles, but you know you got to head west. That was our cardinal direction. That that Mister uh, going to turn Mister Chips into Scarface, and that 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 really got us through. Yeah. Do you think was in your mind was Walter White a narcissist from the get go, or do you feel like that the environment that he was placed in? brought out those qualities in him was he was he deep inside and his subconscious dying to become uh heisenberg or or what or did or did that just happen because of what was going on with him excellent question and by the way anyone who's a fan you know once once it goes out the door and you guys you guys know this when you as you create as well it's really something magical that happens you create and you it's your baby and and then you know it, it, it means the world to you and then it goes out the door and then in a, in a sense it's not yours anymore right which actually is kind of wonderful it's not a bad thing i kind of have grown to embrace that so all of that preamble to say 
anyone who disagrees with them, what I'm about to say is have at it. I wouldn't argue. Yeah, with I don't you. think anyone but, in the comments section on a YouTube video would have any disagreements <laughs> at all. I think you know it's just full of positivity and support, from as far as I know. Yeah, that's yeah. what comments are. Excellent yeah. point. I agree. Oh no, I was wrong. No, that's not it. These things are not. I like that. That's yeah. good. Yeah. What if it was like that for one day? Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. just for one day. Yeah, well, like one, one day. day, it's like a reverse purge where yeah. everyone's like, <laughs> like for one day, people are like, let me get the door. No, I'm the asshole. Whoa, this is great. You know, but no, it's not going to happen. Yeah, wouldn't that be? Yeah, I like, I like this. This is good. <laughs> oh, hey, let's bitch it. Yeah. Um, and then it's so hard for everybody that they're just twice as nasty the next day. I know. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. It's like a yeah, casual Friday or something. <laughs> um, what was my point? It was a. It was going to be a good well, the one point too. That you, I it, was, it was. It was that. Oh, thank you. It yes. was. It was that. Uh, this is the beauty of the collaborative medium of television, and the fact that unlike a movie, uh, and they're all great by the way, but but when you are doing TV, uh, you can have it figured out uh, if you're able to do that. If you think you're able to do that from the get go you know, uh, 50 hours ahead of the end or 100 hours ahead, you know, in terms of episodes, but the way it always worked best for us is to not really know, other than that cardinal direction I spoke of, not to really know exactly where things were headed. And all of this to say, left to my own devices when I wrote the pilot, I thought Walter White really was a great guy. And he was, and he truly needed to do what he needed to do for his, to leave money to his family. I didn't have much more than that. I really didn't. And I figured this good man would become by virtue of the fact of, of immersing himself in this swamp of criminality, he would therefore become bad. But now that we've done 62 episodes and it's all in the past and, and you know, it's, it's, it's what's done is done. What I came to realize, which I did not know at the beginning, is that it's like that old saying about Hollywood. Uh, success in Hollywood, or maybe success in general, but we, we don't think in terms of Hollywood, I guess. It's not so much that it changes you, but that it reveals your true self. Sure. And I think, in my opinion, that's what happened to Walter White. It revealed his true self. There was kind of a monster underneath it all. And, and uh, you know, he says in the final episode, he says, you know, I, after lying, after rationalizing, because this guy's superhero, aside from the chemistry ability and the brainiac nature of his intellect, was, was really that he could lie to anyone, including himself, better than anyone alive. Yeah. And he stops lying to himself in that final episode, and he finally says, I did it for me. But uh, I really think he, there were elements, there was this this overweening pride and ego that you see pretty much from the, the big, you know, the first season on. And it hides underneath that, I think, some sort of really terrible low self-esteem, some sort of shattered, uh, broken image of himself. And I I think there was a monster residing within that, that if these certain uh, elements hadn't come to pass in just the right way, we would have never seen the the monster would have never revealed himself. I mean, you always I, I've seen you talk a lot and we've talked a lot about the show and you're always quick to go. Ah, you know, we just had a lot of happy accidents. There is a lot of skill in what you do. And I, I've asked you before if you like writing and you had one of my favorite quotes about writing. You said, I like having written <laughs> because, the, you know, the, I think what the show does so beautifully is that everyone who worked on the show was knocked it out of the park. You had, you know, amazing writing, amazing performances, amazing costuming, amazing set design, amazing music. Everyone was at the top of their game. But hearing what you're saying now, especially for people who are creators, can you talk a little about the flexibility that you had to have? Because obviously once you get actors in there, they're going to have a take on stuff. You start finding stuff out as you go along. So just about the flexibility that you have to have when you do have an idea of where you want to go and you start feeling like, ah, this is breaking a little bit from what I thought. How, how, how do you adjust to that? And how do you, while still maintaining the integrity of the piece that you want to create? Well, great question. And, and it's interesting. <clears throat> you don't have to have flexibility. I think I agree completely that you need it. Uh, that's, but that's just personal philosophy, personal opinion. But really, the, the beauty of, of, of this job, of, of creating, um, dare I say, art, or if not, if you don't like, if you're not comfortable with the word art, which often I'm not, creating a fictional universe, creating something that previously didn't exist, you can do it any damn way you want. 
And, and you can be rigid. You can say, I, I've got it all locked in my head and we're going to stick right to the path and we're not going to deviate. I agree with what you just said, though. Personally, I think you need as much flexibility as you can muster, provided you've always got that, that internal compass that keeps you on the cardinal direction. You know, I always I think of it really a lot in terms of, I mean, I came out here to do this job 20-some years ago from Virginia, and I think in terms of drive that initial drive I had from Virginia to California, and I thought, I'm probably going to take Interstate 40 the whole way. But sometimes I would, hey, you know what? I hear looking on the map here, Route 66 looks kind of interesting. Now maybe I'll get off for a while, take some back road. That's kind of what it is, uh, the way I see it, that this process of creating a, a long-term story, an episodic story, a TV show. If you, Just as long as you keep heading toward the sunset, so to speak, but you can take all these side roads and diversions and whatnot, that that really is, to me, the most fruitful uh, way to do it. But and you have to know where you're going. You have to you know. You have to know where, where you it's going to I mean, it's you kind of know it when you know it, and it's and suddenly it's like, oh, I'm going to turn east now, whereas I was heading away. That, that might be too big a, a change-up, but something you mentioned a minute ago, the actors, the, what you, when you, and again, you don't have to pay attention to the actors, but I would, I would, uh, I would, I would encourage you to from personal, uh, experience. You watch these actors, a good example, Jesse Pinkman, mm -hmm. uh, probably folks have heard it before. I was going to, my initial idea was to kill off his character. Right. Uh, because after having, Provided Walter White Walt's entree into the meth business, his his uh, his role would have been fulfilled, and we could have killed him off at the end of season one, and Walt would have had this good engine, not good, but this really dramatic engine of, oh man, I want to get revenge. I feel bad. I feel guilty, and I feel you know, I'm going to kill the rival drug gang that did this, and that pr that provides impetus, uh, you know, in in terms of drama and and plot for season two. I was looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope, uh, but we hire this... Uh, actually, no, I, I, let me take that back. It wasn't a bad plan. It really wasn't a bad plan, but early on we realized, my God, this actor, Aaron Paul, is so damn good. He's so wonderful. We'd be cutting off our nose to spite our face to get rid of this guy. We're going to keep him around. And not only that, Aaron Paul happens to be one of the sweetest people in the world. He had truly... I mean, he really is. He is. He has such heart and soul, and and uh, I mean, all these actors brought magic to these roles. But just sticking with the the example of Aaron, he has a, a real sense of morality, and that winds up infusing itself into. I mean, it did with us, infusing itself into the character of Jesse Pinkman. So Jesse, I mean, you watch that first episode. He's just kind of a just kind of a creep. And and uh, which was fine. He was he was a he was fun. He was a fun funny little creep in the pilot episode. But as the show progresses, we writers got to know Aaron. We got to see his many strengths and his complexities as a, as, as a human being. And we wound up sometimes purposefully, sometimes inadvertently, subconsciously weaving those into the writing. And that's exactly what you were talking about. And that's what I subscribe to. Is first of all, I love TV because it's so collaborative as is movies, but, but with a movie, you kind of got to lock that script down. And there's nothing wrong, by the way, movies are great too, but I mean, what I love about TV is when it's really clicking along, you're taking, you're like a, the world's greatest buffet. You're grabbing, oh man, I love what this actor's doing here, and I'm going to write that into this uh, next episode, and I love what the DP has given us something we didn't expect. And, and the skies over Albuquerque, which we weren't even going to shoot in, Originally, that was a whole other story, but the skies are so, I mean, the landscape, the prairie and the cumulus clouds, it looks like a Western. Let's make the show more like a Western. Uh, all these things you get to, you get to, you get to grab from this wonderful buffet, all your most delicious favorite treats. And then you, you know, and then you get the, this overloaded tray full of, you know, goodness. So. Yeah. Jesse Pinkman, by the way, is a great Morty. Like I've thought yes, about, yes. <laughs> right? It is like Rick and Morty. He yeah, is yeah, a yeah. little. He is. A, I mean, I would say Rick and Morty is like Breaking Bad in that yeah. way. But it's just that it's sort of the hapless. Like I just want to help, you know. And they just kind of keep <laughs> getting in the way. But what a great show, by the way. If, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I, I, the T-shirt that I had before said was a Better Call Morty uh, <laughs> from the great, episode, and I was going to wear it, but I like I should dress up because <laughs> this is fancy. But um, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that 
also because Breaking Bad is a show that when it started, it started off very small. Like it did not have a big audience in the beginning, but it was very word of mouth. And then, but by the end, ended up being this enormous hit show. And I just have to say, back to your point about, you know, like being veering off, but kind of knowing where you're going. One of my favorite things about Breaking Bad is that you respected the fans of the show because a lot uh, who, wa who watch the show because a lot of series, you know, they'll they'll throw out these really crazy ideas. And then they'll go, oh, we'll figure it out later. And then it never, it very rarely wraps up in a satisfying way. And it almost just kind of feels like the writers come out at the end and go, you figure it out. And you're like, I don't, well, you wrote this, you figure it out. But that five season arc was the most perfect, it, it tied up so beautifully. Do you think if you had gone for six seasons, would that have felt wrong to you? Or do you feel like, nah, we really just had the five seasons, that's what we needed to tell that story? It, it, there was no right answer at the time, and there was a lot of soul searching and a lot of head pounding. I literally sometimes would gently bang my head against the wall. Sometimes it jars things loose. Sony and AMC were wonderful because they were very, uh, they were very supportive. Uh, when, when a show is doing well, it's probably the dumbest idea in the world to end it. Or it's British. <laughs> or it's British, yeah. And you get six episodes and that's it. <laughs> but, but Sony in particular was just starting to make money on this thing. Uh, I mean, just because the structure of, of how the studio makes their money versus how the, the, the broadcast net, or the network makes their money. They were both very supportive. In particular, Sony was very, I, I appreciated their understanding of hey, guys, I think it's time to end this thing. And they, they were like, eh, they, they did not, and I don't blame them a bit. And if I were doing that job, I would I probably would have fought <laughs> even harder than they did. You walk in, and they're literally taking a money bath. They're like, hey. <laughs> like, uh... Not quite to that level. Okay. But sometimes, what do you mean? Some... <laughs> but all of this to say, uh, uh, we knew in our hearts, um, I knew, I think my writers knew, we all kind of knew that the whole design of the show, I, I, Back to the, or the original question, what was it, where did the idea come from? The thing that excited me, other than taking the good guy and turning him into the bad guy, was, was the level below that, which is taking a television character and changing them at all. Mm -hmm. Because I have probably often said, uh, I've probably said it before, I have said it before, folks might have heard it before uh, in the room. I always, I'm a huge fan of TV my whole life. TV you know, you don't have to be a genius to figure out. It's designed to, to perpetuate a kind of stasis. The the TV shows that you know and love. Bart Simpson never gets any older. You know, it, that, right. and that's great. That's the way it, it needs to be when you want a show to be open ended and indefinite and go on for thirty seasons. That's exactly what you need. Bart Simpson and other and, you know cannot grow up. But I thought to myself. I don't see a lot of TV shows where people actually go through change, and that was what really was exciting, uh, the idea of a finite show. But but when you're pitching that, at the beginning, people are like, yeah, yeah, finite, great. But if this thing's a hit, this thing's going to go forever. You're going to find a way to turn it to uh, indefinite. Yeah, two and a half men just becomes three men. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, right. And hey, that's good. <laughs> I liked it. Uh, three guys. Yeah, three three being guys. adults. Three. <laughs> One fifty-year-old man and two seventy-five-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, man, that's the way I'd be doing it too. That's sure. like you know, it's uh, that's yeah, that's when the money really starts flowing. It's it's, I'm being long-winded as 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 I often am. Let me try to get to the point here. The point being that they uh, Sony and, and AMC were very understanding because the original idea of the cardinal direction was to make it a finite show so then you know we get to season four and then uh the, at the end of season four how many more episodes and it took a lot of pondering and we came up with the number 16 that was between the writers and myself and sony and and, and amc and there was no brilliant arithmetic calculation to it it was just our best stab in the dark our best guess it probably could have been 18 episodes. It could have been 14 episodes. We would have figured it out somehow. But yeah, if it had been six, you know, another another 10 or 13 after after those 16, we might have really risks. We might have really risk getting to the point of, you know, now we're kind of treading water creatively. This 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 plan for this finite show is now getting in this kind of hazy area of indefinite, and mm -hmm. that would have. 
I love money as much as anybody. You know, <laughs> I would have loved to have made even more money on this thing than I already did. But really, far more important than that was I had worked on TV shows that meant the world to me that people, the world moved on from them. You know, where people uh, said, God, I used to love that. Is that still in the air? That was, I didn't want that to happen here. That was, that was the thing that kept me awake at night. It was like, man, I don't want people to think we overstayed our welcome. I don't want people to think we're treading water. Right. Sometimes it's better to, you know, it's better to leave the party with everybody saying, no, no, don't go. Versus, you know, you're the guy with the lampshade and everyone's <laughs> trying to go to bed, <laughs> trying to turn the lights off downstairs. But also th there was, you know, like so many episodes of Breaking Bad, all, most episodes of Breaking Bad are, are like a math formula. They're like a math problem. And I always wondered if there was a really great Faulty Towers episode where they admitted, like, we started with the last scene and wrote backwards, like, how did, how did he get, how did Basil Faulty get to this scene? Right, right. And, I, and so I watch a lot of Breaking Bad episodes, and there's the math formula where they get into some really stressful predicament, the kind where you're like, fuck, oh, come on, you know? And then not only do they get out of it, but it's believable, and it's the only way they could have gotten out of it. And that, to me, seems like, are, are, are you starting at the beginning and writing to that point? Are you, fi are you getting to, are you starting at the end and then going backwards and, and kind of backtracking to get them out of it? We did a little bit of everything in the five or six years we're, five years we're doing this. We did a little bit of everything. Um, I'm so glad that it felt that way. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can tell you for a fact, none of us in the writer's room, especially me, were any kind of mathematical geniuses. So... The, the math, I love hearing that it, it felt like a mathematical calculation sometimes. It felt solid and, 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 and correctly constructed. It just came down to just blood, sweat, and tears. I'm not, I'm not being falsely modest. It, it, there were times we wrote ourselves into corners. I was, I was doing an interview uh, before we got out here. A young lady was asking, you know, uh, when with a couple times, you know, can you name some times you wrote yourselves into, into a real corner? And, uh, the biggest one of all is, is Walt buys this machine gun uh, at, the, at the beginning of the, 16, the run of 16 episodes, final 16 episodes. We had no friggin' clue what he was buying the machine gun for. <laughs> really? And it was so, in hindsight, it was so stupid. But I just thought it'd be cool, hey, he buys a machine gun. I, <laughs> we always, what, and then it's, and then we'll figure it out later, we'll figure it out. Oh my God. I, we really did. I'm not actually proud of that. Um, <laughs> I, we would give all these ponderous interviews over the years to places like the Writers Guild magazine or whatnot. Uh, we believe in organic storytelling, which which stems from, flows from character, it does not flow from plot. And and by the way, I, I really do believe in organic storytelling. But every now and then we just go batshit and we <laughs> put a machine gun in a trunk or the other time was you know Walt Jesse in the RV and, and Hank is, uh, is 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 got him in the junkyard dead That's to rights. That's the scene I was thinking of. And that was one like, of the two did... I mentioned. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was it was blood, sweat and tears. We got him to that point and then we said there's got to be a way out of this. And then for I think it was almost two weeks seven of us in the writer's room trapped like in a snowy cab like in The Shining. Like oh a, yeah. So we're going to die here if we don't figure a way out of this. And and all the dumb ideas that Jesse pitches in that episode. What do you think, Mr. White? Should we just should I just start the engine and just gun it? No, wait. He'll shoot us in the head. He'll shoot me in the head. Well, yeah, that's probably what would have happened. But we, we really pitched that. And then we <laughs> pitched, I think, uh, tunneling down, uh, like cutting a hole in the bottom of the RV and tunneling down through the earth. Just idiotic <laughs> nonsense that could never happen. And we, it took, it took uh, the, the genius, I always say the genius of Walter White is that it took him alone five or ten minutes to figure out what it took six of the smartest people I could possibly find and hire, plus myself. It took us about <laughs> a week and a half, two weeks to figure out what he figured out in, you know, in five minutes. And when you get it, it is such a, God, the wave of relief there's just, it just, it literally feels like the weight of the world is lifted off of you. I just, it's, it's, it's like orgasmic, the feeling of, oh my God, we've got it. And you know, you've got it because it's so simple. And you say to yourself, it's so obvious now, though the best ideas are in hindsight, 
I, it always seems to me the best ideas are in hindsight obvious. I mean, they think about the greatest invention you ever heard of or the greatest idea for a movie or whatever. YouTube is probably the greatest invention. YouTube? Uh, YouTube's a, yeah. that's a damn good idea yeah. for a... <laughs> it is. And you say to yourself, God, that's so obvious. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. That's... But it was all blood, sweat, and tears. We didn't engineer it in some genius... You know, like like the the, the 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 watchmakers at Patek Philippe, or you know, the guys making Fabergé eggs, or whatever. We did we didn't. We just it was just blood, sweat, and tears. We'd get ourselves in a corner, and then the the the, the thing that I'm proud of, though, and I will always be proud of, is we never settled on. Yeah, if they squint at it, it'll be okay. We we said, is that good enough? No, it's not good enough. And I and I I really do believe the fans feel that they they know that watching and they know that you they know that you're respecting them. I agree with that. But you know, uh, also uh, just the idea that um, for any again creators out there, you're not afraid to pitch any idea to make it work, even no matter how ridiculous it is, right. just to go through the process. Like you, you, I would imagine you can't really be precious when you're trying to solve problems like that. So any idea might lead you to the place yeah. that you ultimately need to go. Absolutely true. And again, uh, I'm going to say it, say it again. There's no one right way to do this job, which is kind of liberating, kind of fun, kind of great. But a uh, good rule of thumb, I mean, a good philosophy that I, I adhere to is that uh, there's no bad idea in the room. If you guys, some of you guys have writer's rooms or, you know, partners, or, you know, folks you're writing with or creating with, I would I would strongly urge you to to to, uh, to hew to a policy of everyone would joke in the writers' room. They say you know I, they they would say you know I would say oh that's an interesting idea and they say that means he hates it. <laughs> <laughs> but but even if that's the way they, I never actually I, it, it, it actually. Words are just words, and yet, as we all know, they're actually very powerful. That's indeed. an interesting piece of shit idea. <laughs> oh, I think he doesn't like it. But it, it it's an interesting idea. Keeps you safe. <laughs> sure. That's a piece of crap as uh, shuts you down. Yeah, and, and that's true. People always say, oh, man, he's, uh, Vince is so nice. He's such a nice guy. I'm not nice. I'm not particularly <laughs> nice. I, 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 or rather Sony, was, was paying all these folks a lot of money to be in there. And I wanted I wanted my money's worth. I, you know, the the way to get people to to give you their best is not to shut them down by saying, "Oh, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard." So, you know, it, 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 it would, I, you'd say, "Oh, that's you know, that's interesting," or that's. And sometimes I actually meant it was interesting. Sometimes I was thinking, "I don't get that at all." <laughs> but but I, I'm I'm trying to think of a good example. I can't think of one right off the top of my head. But I guarantee you, at least a half dozen times over the course, maybe more, maybe a dozen, two dozen. Somebody said something that was nonsensical, that just seemed on the face of it, although I wouldn't say it, kind of stupid. And lo and behold, it either became the thing we did or it led to the idea that became the thing we did. I always tell this one story. We had the, we had the, uh, two, uh, we had, uh, we had uh, Tortuga's head, uh, Danny Trejo's head, yep. severed head on the back of the desert tortoise. Yep. And we were all so proud of that. Oh, God. Oh, that's going to be so cool. <laughs> What a non-submergible, as Stanley Kubrick would say, you know, image. Oh, man, let's all go home early today. I feel so good about this. <laughs> and, and George Masters, one of our writers, said, and you know what, then the head should blow up. And that was the one time I said, Jesus, George, quit while you're ahead, man. I was, like, I was like, I didn't say it was stupid, but I said, oh, come on, man. What? No, come on, we've got a head on us. What are you talking about? Oh man, that's great, <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. He said, "No, it's uh, did, did they think about it? Someone's going to touch that head. It's going to be the DEA. They're going to pull that thing loose, make it a booby trap, take out a bunch of DEA agents." He was so right, but that was the one time that I I didn't say it was stupid, but I literally the face I made was like, "What?" <laughs> and I feel dumb about that in hindsight because it was a great idea. Well, yeah. I have some questions. These are just some questions that we got uh, from uh, questions that we pulled off of, of, of social media. And, and then I think I've pitched my idea to you before about Breaking Bad, which is in episode one, season, I think it's episode one, season two of The Walking Dead, they open Merle's satchel and he has a bag of blue meth in there, which I think the special, like the prop guys were sort of giving a nod to I each other. I think that was, honest to God, blue meth from the set of Breaking but Bad. But because yeah. that happened, that ties those two universes together, which means if you follow the timeline for anyone who has chalk drawings and, and, and <laughs> all over their bedroom and then blood on the ceiling where you've drawn the spirals, uh, 
that I write with feces. <laughs> <That's painful. laughs> There's your Twitter bio right yeah, there. So I there write with feces, Vince Gilligan. Well, think about it. There's a finite amount of blood, but yeah, you know, it's yeah. painful. How much can you poop? I feel like I can produce more blood than poop, Vince. I eat, a lot, eat a lot of cheese. Okay. <laughs> so my, my, my idea is that, uh, the, that the two universes this are is tied. This excellent vodka, by the way. It's just water. Uh, that... The two universes are tied, and that at the end of Breaking Bad, which timeline works out, someone tried to make a version of Heisenberg's meth, and it started the zombie apocalypse. I like it. I do. Come on, I right? Do. And, I, and I, this is not the Five first time I've heard this. Five people love that idea. I'm impressed. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm impressed. So a couple, a couple of people just want to know some, some deep dive questions. Um, uh, did Huel ever make it out of that motel room? Poor Huel. Yeah, no, uh, I think he did. He probably did. I and, then, he... and then I want you guys to line up because we're going to have time for some audience questions. So calmly line up. Uh, and then after a couple of these, I'll... Uh, we I will, mean, we'll if you your... think about it, uh, that, uh, I'll give a serious answer to that. There was a couple of cops, a couple of DEA, DEA agents uh, guarding the place. And when they heard Hank uh, was, 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 uh, had expired along with uh, Agent Gomez... Uh, you know, they must have pulled Huel out of there. And then Huel was probably, a, you know, they were probably picking his brain yet again about, you know, what was all this about. So, yeah, I think I don't think Huel's there anymore. Okay. Um, what, uh, so why does Walter White let Jane die? I think I, I have a theory why, but you are the creator. Well, I mean, I think I think he was I was I think he was trying to save. I think his his instinct that you see, his natural instinct was to stop her from choking. And then he stops himself. And I think it's because... I mean, it's anything you want it to be, me personally, and I wouldn't argue with you, whatever it is you come up with, but I I think it's self-preservation, but I think, you know, because she was, she threatened to expose him, but I don't even think that, I think that was like, it was one quarter self-preservation, I think it was three quarters saving Jesse, because I think he honestly believed, and I think in, in the point of fact, he was probably right, that they would have eventually overdosed one or both of them, and it might have been Jesse next time, and I think he was looking out for Jesse and also for himself. Yeah, I, I, I just, as a fan, I read it as that's where, that was like one of the major turning points in his personality that I, I didn't sense at all. He was like, I'm protecting Jesse. Oh, okay, was like oh, was okay. so you see own. it very differently. I saw it, I saw it, but I'm that's, an asshole and you're a nice no, guy. No, no, uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> so I, I, no. So it's a Rorschach This is what test. I love. It, everyone else, uh, it's, a, it's communal property now. Uh, why does Walter White poison Brock? Well, that was to get uh, Gustavo Fring. And that was that was to put all the. I mean, talk about a Bobby Fischer, you know, uh, long play there, with him thinking twenty moves ahead on the chessboard. He needed, he needed uh, to to uh, cleave uh, uh, Jesse Pinkman from Gustavo Fring. There's no way he could have gotten Gustavo without Jesse's help, and that's that's how he had to do it. And it was cold. It was ice cold. Yeah, and also the death of Fring is one of the greatest moments in television and the effects on it were stunning as well amazing amazing um, effects yeah and that's also interesting just sort of like with better call saul you're watching all these characters and you know exactly what happens to them you know like it's already a spo it's already there's already spoilers because you know what happens to every single person right yeah pr pretty much yeah yeah no, we don't right. know exactly what ha it happens to to jimmy but uh what did uh, uh what happened to jesse where do you think he is today I'd like to think he got away. I'd like to think that. What did he do? Did he, did he go back to school? Did uh, he become if, a... If, if he got away. Um, well, he said at one point he wanted to be a bush pilot in, in New Zealand and, and uh, you know, fly over all the various castles that they shot uh, Lord of the Rings at. So yeah. <laughs> I think he said that at one point. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly. I, 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 I'd like to... I really haven't gotten that deep with it. I just, I would like to believe that he, I think he rated uh, a happy ending by Good. the end of the, I, I, that's what I, I'd like to think he had a happy ending, whatever that happy ending entailed. I'd like to believe that he achieved it. That he finally, that he paid for his, he paid for his sins largely. Yeah. And that he ultimately got away and ended up living a happy life. Or just the second after he's driving away screaming, there's a cut scene where he just gets hit by a train. Just, yeah. And uh, <laughs> just totally. Railroad crossing. The yeah. Railroad 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 railroad. Railroad. yeah. Hit a um, bridge abutment. Yeah. Well, uh, where's the rest of Walt's fortune? What happened to all the money? Where do you think happened to all the money? Well, I mean, uh, Uncle Jack and his uh, cronies uh, hit it somewhere. Uh, 
I don't know. That's a good question. I don't, you know, honest to God, we didn't, you know, they stopped paying I us. I need you to think about this <laughs> shit, man. <laughs> they, they, they stopped, Come on. They stopped paying us. Don't they you understand? So we, that's as far as we got. Fucking make it up. <laughs> Because <laughs> what's going to happen is you're going to say it, and then it's going to go to all the fan sites. People are going to go, oh, my God, that's great. You know You know what I learned on, on uh, five, six years of doing this job? I learned that I, I don't make it up well all by myself. Okay. I got the ball rolling, but uh, I would, uh, if it ever came to making it up, uh, I would want my original team back to, to, to help me make it up because it would be pretty sad without them. It would be and a then- sad uh, product without them. So what what happens to Skyler Walt Jr. and Holly? Do you think they live? I mean, ultimately, like Walt Jr. is going to get this money, uh, but do do they live happy lives? Do you think Walt Jr. Uh, grows up to be well adjusted after everything that happened to him? I'd like to think so, and we all know people in our in our lives, and we all know of people, you know, reading the books and reading the newspaper and whatnot. We all know people, uh, or know of people, or both, who have had terrible lives, but nonetheless prevail and and rise above i'd like to believe that happened for them but uh, i also you know the money is so is such a sad stopgap. it's 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 all walt could do in that final episode is give give them the money get get make sure the money gets transferred to them but what does it mean at the end of the day it's you know there's a giant hole in these people's lives that that, that is never going to be filled by any amount of money so uh there's going to be a fundamental sadness to for all of them i think but i'd like to believe that they would nonetheless prevail baby holly probably has the best chance because this all happened before she became you know cognizant of does, uh, you know but she'd be hearing stories for the rest of her natural life does walter die happy or satisfied or sad or regretful or i think all of the above minus happy, but uh, <laughs> well, no, I, there's a little. But he's smiling at the end. Yeah, he's smiling. You know what? It's it's. We gave him the happiest ending that we felt could believably be <laughs> affixed to the end of the, the end of the story. He 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 doesn't, in my mind, doesn't deserve happiness at the end because all the bad things he's done. I think in my way of thinking, he doesn't completely think he deserves happiness, but somehow, you know, it's not happiness he has at the end. It's satisfaction of a final job well done. I think he's satisfied by those kind of things. He's satisfied by getting revenge on the, on the, the guys who killed Hank. He, he's satisfied about having the money go flow to his, his children and his, and his, and his wife you know, you take your satisfactions where you can get them, and I think he, he got them as best he could. But, no, I don't think he's deliriously happy at the end. Let's take some audience questions. What is your name? My name's John Schieffer. And what is your question, John? Uh, hello. Um, your show seems to go in a singular, linear direction, although you say it's meandering a bit. Um, but each episode seems to progress very much in one direction, um, except the fly episode. And I was wondering where that came from. Yeah, the fly episode came from. It's awesome, by the way. Well, I I love it too. I I love that episode, uh, directed by the amazing Ryan Johnson, who just did the new Star Wars movie, wrote and directed the new Star Wars movie, and it and uh, written by. It was fun. Shut up. <laughs> we got puppet Yoda back. Fuck off. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to get aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> and written by uh, obviously I have issues <laughs> Sorry. written by uh, Moira Wally Beckett and Sam Catlin uh, and, and our two uh, playwright uh, former playwright writers on our staff Moira and Sam wrote this kind of our version of uh, you know Waiting for Godot uh, it was kind of a two-hander kind of a stage play episode and we did it uh, not to kill the romance you know the, the oh the you know, oh, we had it all figured out in advance. It was all, we needed a bottle episode. Honest to God, we were so far over budget that season that that we always <laughs> just, that's the truth. We were just getting, just kicked in the butt, you know, uh, kind of rightly so. I was spending, just spending like a drunken sailor, <laughs> you know, and we needed to get back on, on our pattern budget. So we, we came up with this bottle episode and it, we thought, oh, we'll do one of these, it'll be fine. It was the hardest thing to break because we didn't have as much plot to fall back on. 
it was, as you know, it was two guys running around, one guy running around trying to swat a fly for an hour, and the other guy thinking, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> but it, 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 but it, it's saving grace, and, and it's a very polarizing episode. Some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, a lot of people somewhere in between. My wife but loves it, so good. Kudos. Well, right on. I'm glad she's got good taste. <laughs> Clearly, she she married you. She's got good taste. Oh, that's uh, nice. Isn't that nice. I'm keeping isn't that. Isn't that nice? Um, because uh, I know we'll get to the other folks. The, the last I'll say about it, um, polarizing. Uh, but I was I will always forever be proud of it because it it derived from a place of of just it was built on bedrock in character terms, in the sense of the beginning of that episode, Walt is um, incredibly guilty. If Walt, Walt Roy can ever feel guilty, he feels terribly guilty about almost getting his brother-in-law killed inadvertently through his actions. And he's suffering from this terrible manic kind of OCD episode. And that's what the whole episode's about. And that's why I'm real proud of it. And, and the, the two writers wrote the living crap out of it. And then Ryan, that was our introduction to Ryan. Uh, God, what a great guy. And what a brilliant director. He took a very internal show that could have been very cinematically boring. And he, he found angles in that super lab I would have never dreamed of as a director. Uh, my hat is off to him. He's a very impressive director. Thank you, John. Thanks Thank for you. coming. And what is your name, sir? Hi, my name is Eric. And what's your question, Eric? Actually, my question is about the alternate ending, because it, it is where Walter wakes up, and and it says we did that from 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 Malcolm. But I was just wondering what was the influence that you actually had for actually making that alternate ending. Walt uh, Brian Cranston wakes up in bed with Jane Kaczmarek, and uh, it was it was a wonderful episode, uh, wonderful final episode of the TV show New Heart, years ago with Bob Newhart, and that's what we're riffing on. Uh, Bob Newhart had made the Bob Newhart show from about, I don't know, 74 to 78 or something like that, mid-70s, and he had a wife and he had a story. He was a psychi psychi psychologist and all that. And then he does a Newhart show where he's an innkeeper in New Hampshire. So he wakes up in bed next to Suzanne Plachette, and he says, I had the weirdest dream where I was an innkeeper in New Hampshire. So that's we were just stealing lock, stock, and barrel from uh, the great Bob Newhart. And uh, it was just a fun thing to do. We tried to get Bob Newhart... Uh, to make a cameo in it, but uh, we didn't get it. We only got as far as his assistant, and his assistant, <laughs> his assistant was like, "I never heard of your show. I don't think he'll be interested." Oh, that's heartbreaking. So, <laughs> so, oh, I don't that's know. So Maybe who knows? I, you know, it was fun though. Thank you, Eric. Written yeah. by my uh, former that that uh, sketch was written. That the ending was written by my former assistant, Gordon Smith, who is now a twice Emmy nominated writer on Better Call Saul. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Kicking butt. I know you get asked this all the time, but cro crossover Walter White, I mean, uh, is there any sort of crossover to Saul from Walter, Jesse? I maybe? just, and I'm, I have to be a bit coy, but, but it comes from a place of we really don't know that far ahead. But I, all I can tell you is we all would feel like we had really missed an opportunity if Better Call Saul has its whole run and we never see Walter White. I That's probably agree. the best way I can answer it. Yes. Uh, but we, being the first fans of the show, we, we would be sad to never see Walt on the show. Listen, but, I'm happy uh, to read between the lines yeah. there like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write my own story in my head. There you go. You're safe, by the way. You didn't say anything. Uh, what is your name, sir? My name is Courtney. And what's your question? Uh, quick question in regards to your writer's room. Um, I'm starting to have these general meetings now for some projects that I've written and wanted to find out what does a person need to get into one of your writer's rooms? And then also I had a question about Gus. What was the genesis of his character? Uh, to get into our writer, we're always looking for, we're looking for, uh, it sounds like a silly answer to a good question, but we're looking for good writing. Now what that means is, um, I'll give you a good example. And again, I want to stress there's no one right way to do this, and that includes who you're looking for as writers. There's kind of a, been a move the last few years to look for playwrights. Uh, play, ooh, playwrights, ooh, if, a, if a, a man or a woman is a wonderful playwright, that's the one we need to, we need to get a good playwright. I love good plays, but that's the last thing I'm looking for when I'm stocking, when, I'm, when, I'm, when we're filling out a writer's room. Uh, I wouldn't hold it against someone to be a playwright. But what I want to see when I'm reading these scripts, I want to see the dialogue is, a, is the least of it. I want to see the description of what's going on when people aren't talking to one another. I want to see a description of the look 
that uh, that uh, Jimmy McGill gives to uh, Kim Wexler, because this is a, this is a medium of moving images. It is cinema. It is, and I use that word. I mean, it, the only difference to me between television or, or a movie in a theater or, or what you you know or, or something made for YouTube that you might be watching on your phone is is the size of the screen. But it is moving images and it is visual storytelling. And and again, you can do it any way you want. You can make, you can have two people talking and talking and talking and talking, and and they, they can be great. But what I'm into is is the stuff between the dialogue. The dialogue is is the wonderful, delicious cherry on top that you have fun writing after the story has been figured out and after the structure has been filled out. And so I'm looking for the way the writer puts it on the page. Uh, and the di dialogue is a good, uh, as I say, cherry on top. And as far as Gus Fring, um, we uh, had a really great scary bad guy on the show, uh, Tuco Salamanca, who is just this just crazy, rabid, <laughs> lunatic, snorting meth off the tip of a Bowie knife kind of guy. <laughs> and he was going to be our bad guy for God knows how long. On the during the run of the series, and the actor Raymond Cruz, who did a marvelous job, he became unavailable to us because he was a regular series regular on um, on a on a I'm drawing a blank now, but uh, he was a series regular on another show on another network, and they were very nice at that show to let us use him here and there, you know, to schedule around him. But it became impossible to schedule around him. We had to kill his character off, and once we did that, we needed a new bad guy. And we said to ourselves, we're not going to find anyone more batshit scary and crazy than this guy. What do we do? And we said, well, you know, let's go in the complete opposite direction. Let's come up with someone who's very businesslike and professional and soft-spoken. And, and yet, and it's going to take us, it's going to be a real slow burn. So we better hire a guy who can stick with us for the, for the time it's going to take. But we'll ultimately reveal just how willful and brilliant and cold and scary this guy is but we just it was just you know kind of kind of drama construction 101 going the absolute opposite direction of the guy you you just killed off gotcha. but it's amazing just hearing every everything that you describe and i think again for people who are writers or producers or any kind of creators you are really an amazing problem solver because it's not just you're you're solving problems with the stories and what to do with the characters but you're solving these meta stories about when actors come and go or when people are on you know when people are unavailable or you have to have an episode where you can't spend any money it really does seem like your most important job as a showrunner and a writer and a, and a show creator is to just solve problems in the most effective way possible however yeah. you can so very true and 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 not to be not to sound falsely modest but it's the truth it's it's not about me solving problems it's a be, it's about me or about the showrunner in my take on it is it's about in my case it's about me marshalling the talents of the best possible people I can find so that they you know it's it really is kind of there's a certain amount of administration to it you're you're marshalling all your assets to best effect so in other words you know I I want to be you know I want to have the great idea myself uh in the writer's room because it feels good you have sure. an ego boost but if the best idea comes from anyone else in the room, uh, you know, including the writer's assistant, you better, it seems to me, you better jump on the best idea no matter where it came from, and then you better not keep score too rigidly in your mind about who came up with what, because, uh, you know, it's what's that old saying? I always quote it wrong, but it's amazing what you can accomplish when you're not worried about receiving credit. You know, right. we, we really, it's it's really about, yeah, it is about problem solving, but it's about marshalling your efforts and not and not trying to selfishly, you know, hoard all the problem solving and, and the and the and the and the and you know all the credit for yourself. What is your name? Hi, my name is Tremaine Hayho. And what is your uh, question? <clears throat> First off, I just want to say thank you to Vince, thank you, Chris, for personally inviting me to this. Tonight, glad you showed uh, up. So I don't know you why you're not wearing a gray jacket and black shirt. I, I know, yeah. right? I didn't get the memo. It must have gone to my spam. The, the front row's got it <laughs> right there, right next to you. He's got it. He's got. He it. knows what's up, He's guys. Going to get it right now out of his car. <laughs> I saw something about Breaking Bad YouTube channel. Can you tell me 
a little bit about that. You're on it right the, now. The this is yeah. it. Yeah. This is, this is it. Whole it's ex- it exists now. It's YouTube.com slash Breaking Bad. Okay. And it's uh, it, it's basically like they, they will show clips of the show and then fan-generated dra- videos from the show. And it's basically just a big fan celebration about Breaking Bad that involves the fan community to celebrate the 10th anniversary. And if you are a content creator and you want to make anything that's going to appear on the Breaking Bad channel, just post it on social media on, on your platform of choice and tag it my Breaking Bad video. And if you tag that, then they'll pull it in, and then they'll put fan stuff on the, on the channel. So it's not full episodes of Breaking Bad, but it's clips, and it's sort of a, it's a real nice YouTube fan experience to sort of corral the fan community. God damn, you were good. I, <laughs> if you had held a gun to my head, I couldn't have explained it that well. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Well, You're thank welcome. you guys. Thank you guys both. I thank love you. Breaking Bad, best show of all time. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, my friend. You know, we're, we're at exactly in an hour, but we, I'm going to take a few more questions just so that everyone can okay. feel like they were represented. What is your name, sir? Cool. My name is uh, Adam Rodriguez, so hello, uh, Chris. Hello, hello Vince. Adam. And uh, I have a question for your writing and the uh, writing process. How much of your personal life and experiences goes into the script itself? And if there's a character that you can relate most to in Breaking Bad, who could you see yourself like, oh, like, I relate to this person the most in terms of character traits or personality? That's an excellent question, and I'm about to give a glib answer, but that, that <laughs> deserves a, a not glib answer. Um, I don't quite know how to. As again, not a great answer, like not as bad as the last answer I gave. But, but <laughs> I'll take it. Anything's cool with me. I, so. I I don't quite know how to answer that in terms of uh, I I I really I'm not particular. I don't think of myself as being particularly autobiographical. My life truly, and I'm not being falsely modest, is not that interesting. Yeah. It's more interesting now, post Breaking Bad, and but I, I like you could have fooled I, me. <laughs> but you know what? I guess you know what Walter White. Walter White, before he became a criminal, is yeah. probably fairly close to me, if oh. any of them are. Not yeah. in terms of I'm not a scientist. I'm not. I've never taken a chemistry class in my life. Yeah. Uh, not a teacher, <laughs> but just kind of boring and scared of authority and yeah. bland. <laughs> I mean, seriously, write what yeah. you know. I mean, I'm not even joking. Uh, and part of it. I wouldn't call it wish fulfillment. It really was not. But there's a certain, you know, why do we ride roller coasters? Why do we like watching scary movies? Uh-huh. In in my case, not autobiographical at all, but, you know, this guy who's kind of bland and middle-aged and boring, and suddenly he's dipping his toe in criminality and he's cooking crystal meth. I didn't know the first damn thing about any of that, and we got to explore it vicariously through him in the writer's room every week, got to live it, came to the conclusion very quickly, I really don't want to do this in real life. But that's the wonderful thing about writing is you get to live these alternate lives, these alternate uh, existences that, that you may want to live, you may not want to live, but regardless, you, you, you never get, you know, stuff you would never get to do. Not particularly autobiographical. As the show went on, uh, maybe... A, you know, if I'm pushing it, fudging it here, maybe a little bit of, a little bit of Hank in me, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, Jesse, oh, but right only on. only little dribs and drabs. I uh, I can't tell you off the time ahead of any particular scene that whole cloth I took from my life, or yeah. that any of us took from their any of our writers took from their lives. It's more fun, and again, I'm gonna say it for the twentieth time tonight. Do it any way that works for you. Be as autobiographical as you want, you know. But for me. I just like making stuff up. Yeah. You know, my life really is not that interesting. I like <laughs> imagining. I like making things up. I can I imagine myself as Jesse because we're the same, like, white guy mold number four. <laughs> <laughs> it's like me, Aaron Paul, Charlie Day, Matt Bellamy. Like, we're all in that same, like, oh, that guy. Yeah, that's all. Uh, damn good looking men. Yeah, it's I like mean, that Twilight on. Zone episode where you, where it's you, just you, all... you, you order your face at age 18. You can, <laughs> and and number we're all, six looks exactly we're all looks the same. Like you. I'm curious who you relate to. Who do you who do you relate to the most? Um, Probably Jesse Pinkman. Yeah. yeah. And because, like, so conflicted with just uh, basically teetering that line of like getting in too deep and I always was so interested in how like he started off as just kind of you know barely messing around with this kind of stuff and kind of doing small in business but then getting even more into it and personal situations that I've been through you know I've been close to situations like these you know related to my family and such and I always thought well wouldn't it be something if I died fully into that world and who would I be now opposed to who I am now like how different would I be would I still be alive you know, would I be in prison? Would I be dead? And I always think that it's really interesting just to, when you're writing, to be able to explore those things, you know, like you were saying. And um, 
definitely like Jesse Pinkman though, because I often add like feel so much like I couldn't do that business because of that that moral compass, you know, just being like I couldn't live with this. I couldn't be laying down at night, you know, looking up to the ceiling. Like, we all have those moments, you know, before we By go By the way, I would just watch you on a panel. Like, <laughs> honestly, I, I, for a second, I, I, I was starting to get pulled in, like, this guy's a character on a show I watch. <laughs> so well, thank you. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I just, we just have a couple minutes left, so cool. I just want to make sure everyone thank has... Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so Good much. Thank thank you. So much. Uh, a couple more. Yes, what is your name, sir? Uh, I'm Paul Clemens. Paul Clemens, what is your question? Hi. Chris, hi. Vince. Paul, Paul. Um, yeah, I, this is a very different kind of question. I was uh, very curious uh, what the reaction was uh, from Brian and all the rest of you to that rather extraordinary fan letter from Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> that was awesome. I, Anthony Hopkins, uh, oh my goodness, yeah. What a, Sir, Sir Anthony, Sir Anthony. <laughs> or Tony, or Tony. Yeah, is he, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What a what a! I got to meet him. I uh, had had breakfast with him and Brian Cranston. Uh, that was, yeah. What a what a man, what a great guy. What a that was. It was amazing. It was like amazing. It just this this whole thing has been a dream uh, for for ten years now. It, uh, hearing that uh, these people you respect immensely, who who mean the world to you, who have done such important, meaningful, brilliant work, uh, you know, respect what you do in return. It, it just doesn't get any better than that. It was, it was great. A great thing. Cool. Good question. Thank, Thank you, Paul. You. <laughs> couple more, couple more questions. What is your name, sir? Hi, my name is James Rath. Hey, and James. What is your question, James? So my question is in regards to RJ's character. Um, Junior, uh, I, I read somewhere that he wasn't initially written to be disabled, but having a, an actor with a disability playing that role, um, what was that kind of like process-wise to, to write a character who is disabled being played by a disabled actor. Um, did he have any sort of way of consulting uh, with the role or was there disability sort of in the writing room? You know, he was, I don't remember a, a time when, when the character didn't have CP. Uh, I think he was always uh, Walter Jr. In, in, you know, in terms of the character having it. Uh, I, I don't remember a time where, where I conceived it uh, in any other way. But then the question, you know, once the pilot episode is written, then the question is, who do you hire to, to play this role? And I don't want to, you know, sit here and pat myself on the back or anything. It just seemed for authenticity's sake, not for the sake of political correctness or anything, but just for in terms of authenticity, it just seemed like why, in, why on earth shouldn't we give... Uh, a young actor with CP a chance to, to, to play the role. So, and we were rewarded uh, in spades for, for, for doing that because uh, R.J. Mitty, who, who Sharon B. Alley and Sherry Thomas, our, our wonderful casting directors, found, is brilliant in the role, and he is, he is uh, he's just, you know, this wonderful, excellent young actor who is utterly believable in the role, and, and uh, you know, it just seemed like the thing to do. It just seemed... Uh, the, the, the way to go, and then in terms of um, writing the character, we just, once we, once we had that set, we just, we didn't really think much about it, or we tried not to, we just sort of wrote him as a, as a teenager, because that's, that's what he is, he's a teenager, he's just a normal kid, and a good kid, uh, who, God bless him, is, uh, you know, finds out at the end of it all that his dad is a monster, is, is a monster. Yeah. but that's all we ever looked at it as, you know, in terms of, um, you know, he's just uh, he's just a just teenage kid who happens to need crutches to get around. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very you much. James. Yeah, just a couple a couple more questions. I feel weird to cut it off now. There's like two people. I know. I'll, yeah. I'll try to make the, oh, no, the there's answers. Four. Damn it. I'll, I'll try to make them. Do let's speed, see if we can let's see if we can barrel rounded. through this in like five minutes so uh, we can yeah, yeah, let, speed make it, let, let be respectful Thank of everyone's time. Waiting. Okay. What's your yeah. what's your quick right. question? My name is Brendan. And hey, Brendan. I'll be quick. So sure. I'm still on season four, so I got a bunch of spoilers just now. Spoiler, Brendan. Why would you come to a Breaking Bad event if you had not... I'm going to put a little bit of that on you. <laughs> that is on me, yeah. If not all of it. <laughs> but uh, one question I have is... So, in the beginning of season four, you have this character, Gail, who Hank has this tape of him dancing around singing. What inspired you to think of that? I don't remember. I mean, we just, we just, he was such a, he's such a, as you've seen, he's such a, and he haven't, you know, I'm not going to tell you what happens after that, but 
<laughs> but he, but he, and I'll let you discover it for yourself, Brendan. But uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he's such a, as you see, and he's such a goofy character that it just seemed, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not being facetious. I, I don't, that's one, one of the things I love about this job. I don't know, no, none of us know where the ideas come from. It just seemed like a fun thing to do. He's, he's not only is he singing karaoke, but it's karaoke with the weird, uh, uh, not weird, but I mean, it's it's it, he must have done it in Thailand or something because the uh, the the superscript below is in is in Thai, right. and he, so he must have been on some trip to Thailand and he's doing singing uh, singing uh, Major Tom, you know, and karaoke. I don't know, I don't know where we got it. It just seemed it seemed like fun. It made us made us laugh, so we so we went with it. Thanks right, for being thank here. You. Walter dies. Jesse gets away. Uh, <laughs> next question. <laughs> oh, come on, gotta put that on him. I gotta put that on him. Uh, you know, it's still a fun journey. Still a fun journey. Brandon, don't feel bad, man. I thank you for coming. I do. <laughs> that is but, what happens, but, but uh, thank you for coming. Uh, hello. Han Solo's dead, too. Your question? Uh, <laughs> your question? My name is Jerry Ors, and I was just wondering, when you were writing the episodes, did you ever second think yourself or ever almost regret a decision? And if so, how did you deal with that? I'm, I'm very happy to say that now that it's all... Once, once the episodes, we, we killed ourselves right in the screw. We second, triple guest, quadruple guest, quintuple guest ourselves in the writer's room, breaking the episodes, uh, breaking the episodes, all hands on deck, all six or seven of us sitting around and, uh, and, and figuring out each plot beat and, and writing it out in, in Sharpie pen, on a, putting it up on index cards on a three by five foot cork board. That was the single hardest part of the job, bar none. And on average, it took us about two weeks of 10 or 11 or 12 hour days breaking each episode and we would second guess ourselves till the till the cows came home but once we broke the story i don't think we ever uh re-broke anything uh we might have added a scene or two every now and then but once we 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 sweated and we bled and we uh, cried and what our blood sweat and tears uh, but once we got it figured out, we didn't look back. I never really looked back. Uh, so that's that worked for us. Not not looking backward. Uh, once once we had it broken. Thank, Thank you. Good very question. Much. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna take two more because yeah, we got two more and then yeah, because they, they stood in line. They should, they should ask their questions. Hi, what's your name? Renata. And I'm, what is your question? Um, I'm Brazilian. I watched the show in Brazil, and we never had the title of the show translated to Portuguese, so I could never figure out if the um, uh, Breaking Bad, it's um, an English idiom and a, a slang, or if it relates to Breaking Bread from the Catholic, and yeah. it's it means like breaking the math and sure. spreading the evil. I, I was a good Holy Catholic shit, boy. Yeah. I great. remember Breaking Bread. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought yeah, of that. that was <laughs> Oh my God! That's a great question, Renata. Uh, Breaking Bad is an idiom that no one here seemed to. No one here in the West Coast, where we made the, where we started making the show, and in Albuquerque, no one, no, no native English speaking American citizen seemed to know it either. When I wrote the thing, I remember the two fellows I mentioned. I pitched it to. They said, "Breaking Bad. What does that mean?" And they said, well, we like everything you're pitching except for the title. You probably need to change the title. Luckily, I never did. Breaking Bad, where I'm from in the American South, is uh, not even everyone there knows it. But when I was growing up, to break bad meant to raise hell. It meant to, oh, man, the other night I went down and I drank a bunch of Paps Blue Ribbon and I really broke bad. I really, uh, man, I wound up, uh, you know, handcuffs on in the back of a squad car. So it means to raise hell. It means to do, to do... To raise hell, it means to do wrong and and be criminal. And that was yeah. an excellent thank last question. Much. And then I'll a, and then question. I'll say to you, I'll say to you, thank you. All the questions were great. Thank you. And then Good just question. lastly, as we're wrapping this up, ten years Breaking Bad. When you look back on it now, what does it mean to you now? And in, in hindsight, how do you think of the show? What are your sort of final words about it? I, there, I wish I had more pithy final words. I just couldn't be more proud. I just I, I feel lucky to be here, and you know people still want to talk about it uh, five years after it's off the air, ten years after we started. I, I just I, I couldn't be more proud of it. Uh, it very likely is the only thing I'll have on my tombstone, uh, <laughs> and that's and that's fantastic. I, I just I, I I want to pinch myself. I, I every now and then I I even this many years later I'm 
not being, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say every now and then I catch myself thinking, did that really happen? The further, <laughs> the further in the past it gets, the, the more dreamlike and surreal it does seem to me. I think I think your tombstone should say it's a mineral, Marie. Like it's a mineral, <laughs> right on the back. Like, yeah. It should just be made out of like a big geo. Just a big geo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that. But uh, as you can see here, people are very passionate about what you've created. You've created an amazing community, not just for fans, but also inspired people to go off and you know knock it out of the park in their own way. And uh, I just want to say I'm very proud to be your pal, and and thank you so much for creating the show. And then and then Better Call Saul, which we didn't have time to get to. What an amazing what an amazing accomplishment to create a spinoff. Yeah, a lot of spinoffs, not great. Better Call Saul, incredible. So Couldn't congratulations, Peter Gould and the Peter writers, Gould killing and those it on that. guys and Odenkirk. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you to YouTube. Hashtag my Breaking Bad video to submit your video to be on the Breaking Bad channel, which is youtube.com slash Breaking Bad. Someone um, threw pizza, which I think is a positive yeah. celebratory Brandon, thing. look out for the pizza. That'll yeah, be look like out for that. the pizza. You know when they yeah. throw pizza, you've done something right. Vince Gilligan, everyone. <laughs> Thanks to Sony. Thank Thanks you to guys. YouTube. Appreciate it. Have a great night.